Hi, everybody. Okay, so first a piece of business. Sadly, the Peter Arnell lecture for March 3rd has been canceled, and we're going to reschedule it for later in the spring. But so um, Peter will not be lecturing on the on the third. It'll come up in a few weeks later. Um, but so with that out of the way, I'm happy to introduce Dennis Shelvin. Um, I've known Dennis a long time. Dennis is an architect here in Los Angeles. I don't want to say how long he's been here or how long he's worked with Frank Gehry, but he set up. He was kind of the person. Uh, along with Frank, who set up Gary Technologies. Um, and I don't know if you'll talk about that a lot, but it's an incredibly interesting model for architects um, to leverage things that Dennis had developed along with Frank's office in the architecture firm and apply it not only to software tools, but also to other architects' work. And the influence of uh, Dennis's thinking is not just in the Gary office, it's actually on uh, a lot of my friends and colleagues' buildings. It's on Asymptotes building in Abu Dhabi, it's on more or less everything Zaha Hadid has done that really has spread a lot of intelligence to a lot of architects. And that's one of the most interesting things about what Dennis has done. Um, I think I first met Dennis way back in the 90s when I had heard he was developing a modeler that connected geometry with material properties. And Dennis was telling me he was working on a paper modeler and a metal modeler so that when you would model on the computer, the models you were making would have inherent in the geometry the material principles of what you were thinking about. And for me, that was a revolution. I'd never heard of anybody even having that idea. Um, so from that time to the 90s, I've always followed what Dennis is doing very closely, and he's continued to connect the abstract world of data and information and geometry with the physics of materials, with energy, with construction logistics, with all kinds of data-rich um, information. And now watching what Dennis and the whole Gary Technologies team are doing out at uh, Ideas with the Super Studio, with the PowerPack Super Studio. I'm seeing them even go to sensing technology and building not just into the design phase, but actually into the life of the building, all kinds of information and intelligence. And I'm, I'm looking forward to Dennis talking to us about that tonight. So anyway, I think that's enough of an intro. Um, I mean, Dennis is also an associate professor at MIT, where he's been for quite some time. Um, in computation and design there. And this last year, we've been lucky enough to have Dennis uh, kind of leading the, the Gary Technologies Super Studio out at the Ideas Campus. So it's a pleasure, Dennis, and look forward to it. Great introduction, and thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of preamble and then uh, dive into a ton of stuff. It's going to be pretty fast. Um, I think just based on that introduction, my history is interesting because I, I came from, actually I'm a failed physicist and kind of a wannabe philosopher, uh, moderately successful engineer and moderately successful computer scientist and architect, uh, and arrived at Frank Gehry's practice with kind of a bag of computational tricks and thought I was pretty smart and then collided with what I think are some of the most um, uh, complex, most, Ill, most difficult to sort of computationally formulate uh, problems that you can imagine. And I won't try to, and I don't try to, uh, describe or pretend to understand what is in Frank's mind, but the collision of this sort of rigorous computational approach and whatever it is that Gary Parkers is doing kind of informs uh, everything that, that Greg talked about and everything we're going to talk about today. Uh, this is going to be sort of span between uh, very practical things because I think both Frank and GT and I and that community share a passion for thinking about the evolution of architecture as a profession and what it can be and what it will, I think, inevitably be. Uh, it is certainly changing. Um, and uh, we want, we have a certain, I think, a set of agenda about empowering 
design and empower the architecture as uh, all of this change comes to both economic, computational, and cognitive, theoretical arrives, and we're all kind of in the mix of that. At the same time, I think you'll see this kind of a computational philosophical thread that I kind of mix into this. It's just part of what I think about at night when I'm not thinking about selling some software or something. So um, can we do the lights a little bit? Yeah, that's a lot. Okay, so I just um, I want to start with this uh, this kind of touchstone phrase that I've been using of information architecture, and that's uh, a very heavily loaded term. Um, and so I guess I would say, first of all, that as architects, we are increasingly in the business, not just of generating information, we don't just generate designs, but information is becoming uh, part and parcel, it's becoming infused into architecture, and as architects, we are delivering information and information-rich uh, facilities, information-rich uh, artifacts. So, so architecture has a kind of information component increasingly, that's part of what we do. From the computational side of things, uh, information architecture means a specific thing. Um, and as computer scientists, we think about the architecture of information, that is to say, roughly, and I'll come back to this quite a number of times, the shape of information, the form, its structure, all these terms that are more or less borrowed from architecture, um, but I think, you know, are not just metaphors, but I'll try to make the thread that they're actually real, that information has a space, that space is important to uh, technology and also to architecture. And specifically, uh, I'm talking about the information architecture of architectural information, if that makes sense. So I'm going to fuse those two uh, very much together as I go forward. The common denominator between these two worlds is space. And as purveyors, as architects, we're purveyors of the spatial experience of humanity. It's sort of our business. Um, and we think we know it pretty well. Um, I'm going to introduce some other notions of space borrowed from computation and contemporary mathematics and physics, which I believe uh, herald the possibility of, a, of an expansive view of space that architecture hasn't grasped yet. We're working with it, we model with it, but we don't understand it yet as architecture. And architecture can take, and there's a sort of an expansive possibility for architecture around this reconfiguration of space. So there's some synonyms that you know we all know, things like shape, like geometry, form is a funny one, things like topology, uh, there's a bunch of computational flavors of this. I would argue that they're all similar, and I'm going to explore this kind of spatial infusion of information, architecture, process, et cetera, as we go forward. So let me just start with the motivations for a lot of this. And again, it's sort of like landing in the Gary world and being uh, you know, perplexed and confounded by uh, the sort of the phenomenological happenings of, of what they do. So this is really what I encountered when I landed at, at Gary Partners. And this is Jim Glimp's uh, quote, uh, former partner of, of Frank's, that basically as they were trying, as Frank was pushing the boundary of form, this is the, the kind of the touchstone, that if you can model it in paper, uh, we can build it. And these sort of forms, uh, these paper-like surfaces, uh, which, uh, which Greg referenced, you know, they're, they're fairly um, ubiquitous in Frank's, I'd say, you know, mid-work. Mid I think he's expanded kind of radically beyond that. But there's something very curious, very profound, about the notion that you can take a small sheet of paper, be doing this kind of very tactile, sort of activity in space, and then have the confidence that that form projects all the way through the processes of engineering and computation and construction, and winds up at this scale, um, full scale, and is also sort of comprised of individual sheets of, individual sheets of paper-like things. So this paper-like quality is kind of an interesting, you know, it, it's, a, it's an interesting kind of phenomenological happening um, that, that binds model making in space with, um, with physical construction. What's interesting to me is you can think of this as a computation um, for which there are no computers involved. There are no numbers involved. It is a, uh, it is a model, it is a projection of, uh, and it is, it is a really a mathematical algebra of these types of shapes that, uh, that again, you know, are formed into assemblies here and are projected all the way through. And um, suffice to say, this became uh, quite an obsession of, of mine and others uh, in, the, in the firm. I wound up writing a PhD thesis on 
this question about modeling about specifically about the paper surface as a constructability proposition. Um, but there's this notion that you know, in order to you know, project into the business of architecture, we have to do some sort of documentation of that, and that's where the computer comes in. And so this notion, not just of going from digital artifacts to physical, but actually kind of going around, closing the loop from a physical proposition through digital and then back up into physical, is kind of the remarkable kind of problem that I think you know, is really, uh, I think it's unique in Frank's practice, and it sort of does cast a kind of unique phenomenological kind of problem in, in the work that I've been involved with. So, you know, that's kind of the heart of the, the beginning of the processes that we've gone through. Um, what's interesting is now, uh, and even at that time, the, uh, you know, in order to get things into a digital world, you have to pick a set of algorithms. You have to pick a digital language. And as we were wrestling with this stuff, there were actually a set of them. And I won't go into the mathematics of this too much. A lot of students now know this. These are sort of curvature constrained surfaces where we're looking to kind of limit the, the, the curvature to what a sheet of material can do. These are what are called developable surfaces, which is a kind of an abstraction of what uh, a very pure unfoldable surface can do. I think lots of people know these uh, at this point. It's certainly out there. But what's interesting is that the selection of the algorithm led to completely different representations, uh, completely different means of building, uh, completely different economics, and you know, in, in some ways, subtly, subtly different uh, resulting forms. And you may not be able to kind of tell the difference between this shape and this one. Maybe you can. This one's a little bit more, you know, free flowing. This one's a little bit more uh, a harder edge. Um, but the idea that you know the selection of an algorithm, the language, we project all the way through the economics and process of building and wind up trace as a trace on the final form is a really interesting problem because essentially, and I think we know this, you have the, the possibility of selecting the wrong tool and having that tool and the language, the, the computational language that, that that tool is founded on drive you as a designer. So this idea of sort of you know, picking a language and working in that language and that language being a computational precise thing is something that's really interesting about you know, this problem of going digital, sorry, physical, digital, physical, or other, you know, uh, design pipelines. So, you know, this is sort of a, a started an obsession about what is this digital language, what is this digital artifact, and how does it connect to the world? Um, moving a little bit forward, there's now a term for this process. We didn't have it at the time, but it's now goes under, under a kind of, I don't know, bar, boring term that is used ubiquitously in, in the industry called building information modeling. It is sort of a fascinating set of propositions, and it's not just the notion that we can work in three-dimensional space as opposed to two-dimensional drawings, um, but it, it unlocks a whole host of other interesting things. Um, the, the first one is kind of a move from a symbolic representation. Uh, drawings are interesting in that they are both spatial, but they are also a language. So if I put a door symbol um, on, on a drawing, it's a quasi-spatial thing that then projects to the possibility of a set of doors, right? But it requires a human intervention to do that. There's this notion that building information modeling is not just about 3D objects, it's about objects and their relations. So the relationship between uh, a beam and a column, a beam and a surface, uh, a wall and a space, these are the sort of things that computation is now able to capture. The object relation model is, you know, is deep in uh, computational history, um, but it's interesting to see it expressed as a three-dimensional spatial proposition. Um, we can now have computers, you know, move from plan to section to 3D to, you know, table to. Uh, so the notion that arc that we're talking about sort of multiple possible descriptions, and the ability for a computer now to traverse between these different languages is, I think, central to this notion. Um, and it turns out there are an awful lot of objects and relations that are candidates uh, for this sort of this network of, of objects and relations. There are the geometric objects, the spatial relations of a room to another room. Uh, there's metadata, which are the sort of the fields, you know, what is the fire rating? Um, there are parametric logics, uh, which have an interesting kind of spatial proposition they'll come back to. There are agents, people like us, documents, hyperlinks, etc. So we're starting to move to what I think 
from a computational and, and sort of practical perspective, is a very interesting mix of tons and tons of these different sort of uh, you know, uh, spatial and non-spatial objects and a network of relations. And this is the network of relations that architecture is in the business of manipulating and working through, not just the physical, not just the documents, but that whole spectrum of connected, heterogeneous space of, of different things. Um, and that has an interesting kind of spatial and, uh, and I think, uh, ultimately, phenomenological proposition, uh, and certainly computational one. So um, I want to talk about, use that kind of, I hope that wasn't just psychobabble, but um, I want to use that kind of framework to talk a little bit about you know, what we do uh, as architects, and specifically what Gary Technologies is in the business of. So we often think, I think, about the product. You may not think about a building as a product, um, but it's the end proposition of, of a design process or an architectural process. There's the process itself, which I think people are getting more and more interested in, how things are cut, how they're fabricated, um, how uh, information moves around, um, you know, just that whole how you optimize and, and save energy and uh, you know, improve this. And then there's the information itself. So this is really, for me, the core of the things that we're concerned with at GT, and I think our, ultimately architecture is concerned with. That relationship between product, processing, for information is becoming really central to the business of architecture. Um, I would argue, uh, and this is a pretty big leap, two things. First of all, when you think about the project, the architectural project, that project is not just about delivering a building or delivering a design. It's the concurrent design of all of these things. And again, that's not as alien, certainly from the process perspective, as it used to be. So at Ideas Lab, we're thinking about robotics, um, you know, work, you know, and the idea of you know 3D cutting or milling, uh, you know, rapid pro rapid prototyping, things like that. People are beginning to understand that that's something architects should be interested in. That was not the case uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Architects were in the business of generating designs, and somebody else took care of all that messy business. Um, I would argue that information is now becoming a very strong uh, central piece of that. The bigger leap is that there is what I would call a topological or spatial congruence among these elements. That is to say, there is some sort of shared spatial structure between the building, the processes of making it, uh, and the information. And that might seem like a big leap, but when I look and when I talk to people at GT, you know, what are we doing? We are developing these systems. And these systems are systems of design, systems of uh, space and geometry, systems of making, and systems of data. And you can sort of, not perfectly, see that relationship in the things that I would show from here. So just as an example, this is um, a Frank Gehry project, the Fondation Louis Vuitton Museum in Paris. Um, you can see the, the physical model, some of the digital artifacts. Um, and again, there's this network notion that now these models are being developed in all sorts of technologies, all sorts of systems, all sorts of representations all around the world are being concurrently designed and somehow you have to control this process through some sort of you know, structure, some sort of product structure. Um, and without getting into too much, there is um, a historical computational structure which has been very effective you know, for the last 50 years of computer science. Uh, we're going to move beyond that in the, kind of the final half of this uh, lecture. Um, but it is the notion of a product tree. Um, some people call it a hierarchy. And it's a very simple idea of dividing and conquering the world. So I can take this very fuzzy idea of a project. I can say, well, let me break it up in terms of the architecture, the structure, and the mechanical. I'll give the architect that little, you know, that little piece of the, the pie. I'll give these guys to others. And then those will get developed further. So we have used, and, and again, from a computational perspective, this is a super way, effective way of organizing the world. Um, so you can essentially divide and conquer if you need to look for you know, the architecture, you know immediately I'm not going to look at this bucket, I'm going to look over here. These trees have a way of expanding, um, so I can start breaking these down into the first floor, the second floor. Um, I can make new versions of these, and these trees can sort of mix and match. So this is, again, the, the sort of the topology that historically uh, computer science and, you know, and we have, um, have built practice on. Um, 
just by way of passing, it's interesting that these, uh, these representations, you can imagine sort of an evolution of these different branches from concept design to contractual document to the delivery uh, descriptions and fabrication systems itself. But it's not really a linear process because the concept never goes away. And so we're really looking at objects themselves that are multi-representational and a relationship across these different iterations of these trees and branches. It's a very complicated set of net, uh, network set of objects and relations. It's just the beginning and it gets worse from here. Um, but this is the way that we have uh, managed this in the past. And it is, again, by breaking down the project into a set of containers and then smaller containers and smaller and smaller containers and giving different authorities to different people to manage those, uh, those branches and then often taking kind of cross-cutting views where we have sort of specific aggregations or, or you know, locations of, of information or coordination or interest that, we, that, we, um, that we're interested in. So this has been a very effective way of kind of managing uh, you know, thousands and thousands of objects changing over time, changing over distance, and all kind of, kind of flying together uh, to represent this, uh, this project as it evolves over time. And we've had technologies to do that. Um, one of the things that kind of has infused over this network is this idea of parametrics. And, you know, there's a lot of different ideas about what parametrics is, um, but put simply from a, from a kind of a computer design perspective, it's about putting the intelligence, the design intent into the model, and then allowing that model to play that intent out. So we can sort of package up a lot of information and a lot of intent about different systems, plug it in there, and then as the form evolves, these changes are propagating over that tree, and a change in one part, of the, in one branch of the tree can sort of flow and infuse itself across the system. These objects are very intelligent. Um, this is the essentially the digital project system that we um, that we built uh, based on aerospace technology, um, and these objects are packaged package up a bunch of things. They can be self-solving, they can do statistics about themselves and their neighbors, they can look at variations of sort of, uh, uh, you know, mass customization variations across uh, panels, they can produce their own documents. So there is this sort of object-oriented approach to now building, plugging in intelligent types of objects and uh, letting their differences play out. This is just uh, one example, kind of a very interesting one, where uh, we're looking at a glass, uh, a glass uh, uh, panel that will fit into a set of extrusions um, on the surface of the, uh, the Louis Vuitton Museum. This is Andrew Witt's work, um, who's a phenomenal um, uh, architect in mathematics in his own right. Um, and what's interesting about these shapes is, um, well, a number of different sort of forms of various complexity were looked at to solve this problem. Um, you know, and just to kind of you know, map it out, you can look at different geometries with more and more and more degrees of freedom, information, complexity. They all do various different things to the potential and to the quality of the, of the shape. Um, and the net is that the one that's selected mo mostly for economic reasons uh, is the notion of a cylinder. So we're essentially fitting cylindrical shapes into these, um, into these uh, frames that are defined by the mullions. And what's interesting kind of in passing is these, these cylinders don't necessarily fit exactly. So we've got a very complex shape and we're rationalizing and kind of pushing the variation down uh, to a set of approximations and then actually taking up the difference in terms of some rubber material that's gonna kind of you know, deal with the noise and the variation between uh, these very rational shapes. Um, so here is one of those cylinders fitting itself to a shape. It then unfolds itself generates its documentation. Um, we can look at you know, optimizing over uh, you know, the global configuration of these things. Um, and then these are just some of the other you know, shots of, of uh, pieces. This is building information modeling, I'd say, at the most extreme level. Uh, and it's constantly evolving. But every clip on the surface is modeled. Uh, uh, forms are you know, numerically sampled uh, and scanned for uh, accuracy of, of um, fitness to the model. Uh, it's a pretty expansive view of the, um, of the digital information space. Um, just in passing, I'm going to kind of move to the information side of this. 
there was a sort of a prototypical system that was built to manage all of these models and their variations and extractions and processes. And we used um, a set of internet technologies to move these, um, these models around. Kind of the interesting history of this is that GT has used uh, what's called source control technology. It's the technology that computer programmers use um, to manage code and then to kind of up upload and propagate uh, code from like their kind of local view into some master, master model. So we've actually used open source uh, code control technology to manage models of distance for a long time. Uh, the problem is they're not, those, those um, tools are great for command line programmers, but they're not very visual. So Andrew and the group in Paris uh, developed a kind of a front end, a view, visual kind of social view that would allow people to kind of aggregate these models uh, and then could do some computing on the back end. So some of these optimizations are very computer intensive. You could upload a model and then ask you know, a set of computers to solve that, move all those little uh, cylinders around and then play it back. So this is kind of an interesting kind of networked topology, networked approach to information uh, that we'll come back to a couple of times later. Um, that was kind of an abrupt change, but I just wanted to go up a scale and talk about kind of another seminal project, which is the work that we did for the Lower Manhattan uh, Command, Construction Command Center around the World Trade Center. Here, we're taking that notion of tens of thousands of objects distributed over space, all these kind of different computational representations, and packing together really a city level, it's called a 4D model. It's objects and their time and schedule. Um, you can see different kind of views of this. And the point here is a couple things. First of all, you know, we're talking about information at a huge scale. And this is one of the remarkable things about these systems is that with various kind of swapping out of those branches and trees, we can develop an overall framework for the city of New York that carries you from the city to the building to the floor and down to very specific um, you know, branches, perhaps all the way down to the individual bolt. Um, so this is just, I think, at one level, an interesting a notion about how you can scale these systems to track not just individual buildings and drawings, but up to potentially a city or a planet worth of information. Um, the other one is that uh, this information turned out to be very valuable, not just to engineers, but to the community. So the LMCCC, our client, was set up really as a government agency to allow high-level stakeholders, the mayor's office, the governor's office, you know, coordinate among all these different organizations and assert some sort of visibility and control of what was going on. Um, so this is a very high-level view of one particular issue. Uh, and I guess in the interest of time, I won't go into too much, but involves a specific excavation strategy and whether or not that excavation strategy would have a huge potential risk to the schedule of opening uh, the more on time or potentially disrupting huge amounts of travelers moving through the city. So that kind of information turns out to be not just inf interesting to architects and engineers and construction folks, but even to the city at large. And we had another kind of iteration of this project where that really became exposed to the community of New York. And this is a website that was developed. It's got a you know, database back end. It's got a Google Earth and Google Maps front end. And you know, during the time that this was that this was in effect, you know, anybody in the community could go and look at any point in time in the evolution of 15 years of projected work, uh, understand what was going on, what was planned. Uh, you know, it was a way of exposing what was going on to the community. And you can see that there's some uh, some filtering you can do. You can look by sort of criticality of. Uh, of impacts of, of uh, street closures, et cetera. There's a 2D view of this thing as well. Um, so if you're a business and you're working, you know, you're, you're in this area, and you're wondering when that jackhammering is gonna stop. Um, you know, it's a way of sort of, you know, ex again, exposing this very complex set of, you know, of construction issues to a community. And that was kind of a, an epiphany and a very important kind of moment for us where, where it became, you know, it sort of exposed this idea that this information is is interesting to a larger community than just architects and engineers, but it has to be, uh, you know, transmuted or projected in a way that makes sense to a community. So that was kind of, and and also that the web could be a super powerful way of uh, aggregating and distributing really limitless amounts of information. So 
think that's kind of the, the trajectory that got us to some of the new technologies that we're developing. Um, okay, we're going to go to a um, which is the next generation of what we're working on. So, uh, you know, the past, I think, has been very much about, you know, this issue of, of design and constructability. We're still hugely involved in that. And the notion of kind of heavy, um, you know, aerospace, uh, hierarchical views of the world that have been super effective for a long time, and I think are, are playing out very much in the industry. Um, but the next generation is more interesting still. Um, and it's the notion of moving from, from this notion of a hierarchy to a network. Um, and really, architecture is, is not that well structured by kind of divide and conquer. Uh, because, you know, uh, agendas and, and, uh, and performance requirements and things like that, they tend to infuse. We are often interested in uh, structure which is architecture or structure which is form. Or you know the notion that you can break uh, you know you can break a building down by floor and not you know encounter issues where that hierarchy kind of is broken um, is uh, is pretty apparent as an architectural proposition. It's not well you know it's not well divided and conquered. So and clearly when we think about networks and this sort of information networks, we're thinking about the web. Um, and the web is really a remarkable thing in terms of just and, and you all know and use it every day. But the combination of unlimited information and, in fact, you know, increasingly simplicity of, of access and you know, orientation to what you are interested in and sort of disregarding you know, the limitless amount of information you might not be interested in. This is sort of the heart of like, contemporary, uh, you know, it's everything that's going on in the valley, you know, this notion of social, I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm a person, I'm an individual that has a certain set of interests. I've got my friends, I've got my network, my close network, my far network. That's a really interesting way of organizing this explosion of available information. Um, and so we're taking a, a bit of that and now trying to connect it back both to how we manage projects, and I would try to stick to this larger question of this network view of information and architecture and form and space and all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to walk through two of those. Um, I'll try to skip this really quickly, except to say that you know, for those of, that of you that are in the biz, um, this notion of the kind of the project organization, the architects over here doing drawings, you know, you ship some arch some drawings to the engineer, they do some modifications, or they do it, they, they take your background, they ship it back, they you know, give it to the owner. This is still kind of the state of the art in our uh, in our industry, and it is sort of an inherently uh, disconnected and broken process, sort of by design, and it's intended to kind of organize and uh, control uh, the kind of rich possibility and the madness of, of, of uh, you know, of design as it, you know, encounters the, the proposition of actually, you know, getting it built and paid for and going through the contractual legal business. So, um, you know, and the documentation and the processes have really sort of mapped to that. So, you know, within the design, our architects world, in the studio, there's a lot of fluidity, a lot of, you know, change, you know, people are using all kinds of media, and then they stop and they take three weeks to kind of do the drawings and make sure they're all, you know, they're all kind of coherent. And then they ship it off. And then somebody over here starts, you know, analyzing and pricing it. Um, and that information is already obsolete. So it's sort of by design, given the available sort of ability to manage information in the traditional world, we're still kind of in that world, but it's eroding very quickly. So you no longer have, you know, four weeks to get your design development package up, do all the redlining get it all perfect, and then ship it out. People are asking for information on a, on a much more frequent basis. You've got to get information out this week. You've got to get it out today. You've got to get it out in the next hour. And I think this whole thing is converging to essentially continuously connected systems. So this is kind of the, the model of the future, um, where it's a little bit uh, computer science-y, but there, you know, you've heard about these cloud stuff. There's all these information stores out there. It can be very specific to one set of interests. Um, they can be very general. Um, and then out in the world, there are people and physical things, right? People who have specific interests, buildings, uh, artifacts, and like. And in between are a set of interesting converters. There are the, the you know, there are the screens, the PDAs, digital surveying equipment, uh, robots, and all the the the, the like. 
And this stuff is becoming increasingly continuously on, continuously connected, and that's a very different kind of world to live in um, uh, from you know, having humans take documents, transpose them, take authority, give it to somebody else as a document. So this is kind of the future, and this is really kind of where uh, we're starting to play. Uh, for what it's worth, you're already doing this. Again, you know, this is for those of you that use Facebook. You know, you're doing this. I understand. You know, young maybe young people are no longer even using this. But the notion that you have kind of a social space, uh, a set of interests, a set of people that you care about, and you're connected to them, and you have sort of a con you know a controlled but very fluid uh, and very dynamic world of, of interests is something that we're trying to translate into the project world. So um, I'll try to skip the pitch. This is some software we've been developing. It's called G-Team. The idea is, again, this idea of sort of connected. There's an auto thing going on. OK, so all kinds of documents. It kind of has this social view of projects and files and changing. Uh, you can take a bunch of different objects and mash them together. So I can take a Rhino model and SketchUp model and a digital project model and a rev model and pack them together, start compiling them take different views, different snapshots. This is um, the architect's surface against the fabrication model for a particular mock-up. Um, there's, again, tremendous ability to scale these systems. So you can really kind of pack a world full of bolts into these systems and then selectively pull up the ones you want, um, connected to drawings, uh, hyperlinks, et cetera. So that's interesting in of itself. But what's interesting even further is that our system is part of a sort of a community of these sets of information. And our interest is sort of sitting in the middle of this and kind of exposing the architectural community and the, the user experience around, uh, around building design and construction from a vast set of these sort of information sources that are tracking very different things. So just to give you a sense of some of these things that we're doing, this is, uh, again, a project of Andrew's where he's tying the models in G-Team to a Radiance server, which some of you may know is one of the sort of the state of the art uh, lighting and, uh, lighting and, and uh, visualization software. It's out of Lawrence Berkeley Labs, uh, funded by um, the, the US government. Um, it's used for you know, visual glare, uh, solar gain, and the like. So um, he's essentially running the model on G-Team, connecting it to another server, which is picking that up and doing energy simulation. Here's just a little bit of a view of that. Let's see, I'm going to try to skip forward a little bit. So here is, um, you know, here's some models in G-Team. I can pull up one of them, you know, visualize it in 3D, and then uh, cut ahead a little bit. So uh, we have this, okay, so here is, um, So then there's this idea of an app. And really what you're doing is taking that model and sending it off to another server, just shooting it off as a web address. That server picks up the model. And you can start layering on things like different material properties, right? uh, set up different times, different simulations, uh, you know, and start doing um, energy solving. And then we can actually plug the GT model into that view. So we're starting to look at you know, user experiences on the web where, like Facebook and YouTube, you know, this information is coming together in the project space around sort of specific possibilities of interest, right? Solar analysis is nothing new by a long shot, but the idea that you can connect different sort of spheres of interest into a web experience that's kind of unique to the to you know purposeful for this for this application, but as part of this larger community is kind of an interesting proposition. Um, there's been some other interesting extensions of that kind of scaling it up. And just again, to kind of highlight the kind of the scaling possibility of the web, uh, this is the same approach, but now applied to essentially a citywide model. Uh, there's some geometry processing that sort of uh, divides this into the floors on every building. This is obviously lower Manhattan, uh, you know, 10 foot, uh, essentially 10 foot cubes, the rooms themselves, and you can start doing this sort of environmental simulation at vast scale. Um, so again, the interesting thing is that there's sort of limitless scalability, limitless po uh, possibility for these things. I'll show another couple examples and then I'll get to uh, the hard stuff. 
So building controls, I don't want to play this too much. This is an example, uh, which is a, um, it's a curve and wall tracking system that we've developed. Again, you'll see uh, the G-team view of a panel, all of the kind of the data being extracted from it. It's a way that uh, this client of ours, Contract Lasers, is using to manage their panel supply chain. It's just one more example. Um, and uh, plug it into Facebook, so you can put a model on Facebook now. Um, and uh, so the next thing is again, so now we've got all of these information stores and kind of the structure around those. And then how do you connect back out into the world? So this is really where um, the ideas work uh, comes into play. So we're really looking at these kind of devices now that I can call translators. They're digital physical translators. Things like CNC equipment, 3D printers, robots. They're taking digital space and converting it into physical and potentially vice versa. So the, um, so the proposition of the Super Studio is something that, uh, that Frank brought, um, which is, um, and, and he had an experience on something called Skylab. I asked these groups, show of hands, who knows Skylab? Who's heard of Skylab? It's a remarkably small number of people, and <laughs> it's the old people. Suffice to say, there was a small international space station <laughs> that was developed in the 1970s, and Frank had a role in that. And what he remarked about and, and wrote and has written about is that you know, systems that in a building, you know, like if you look at the, the cooling system of a building, it takes up basically a floor. You go somewhere in this in this building or on the central campus, there's a floor worth of mechanical equipment um, that is has no other purpose than cool air and, and put it in ducts. Um, and, um, and at that time in the 1970s, if you looked at a computer, it took up a floor, right? Um, and so what so Skylab was a problem about how do you take a building worth of, of you know, systems and start compacting them down to the point where you can actually put them on a rocket and carry them into space and they would occupy something you know, relatively small. So what happened over the ensuing 40 years, if I remember the math right, is that computers went from the building size to the, to the refrigerator size, to the desk size, to the, you know, to the desktop size, to this size, to down to you know, things that you can't barely even see, and mechanical systems are still the size of the building. Um, so this notion that, that um, so the question is what would happen if building systems had, you know, were, would undertake that sort of evolution? And I think it's a fascinating problem, and I think it is starting to happen. But the other thing is that if you look at sort of the built infrastructure, most of it is really sort of distribution. And very, you know, and you know, and there's not actually that much space for occupancy. It's all kind of ducts and streets and all this business and kind of moving stuff around. What happens when it's networked, when it's wireless, uh, when it's disconnected and it's smaller? So that's sort of the proposition. I don't. I think students remember it from the class. It's evolved a lot as we sort of try to figure out, um, you know, together what this is about. Frank is very interested in kind of is there a next generation of architectural form that emerges from that. Uh, but I wanted to sort of connect back to this idea of the devices. So, you know, it turns out that computers have all sorts of scales and all sorts of, um, you know, physical, digital sort of behaviors. They can be the size of, you know, large-scale robots. They can be smaller kind of cutters. They can be scanners. They can be something as small as, you know, as something that fits on a credit card, right? Things like the, uh, the Leap Motion device, I should also mention Germans uh, work in the studio. Who is, and, uh, and Kiddock, who are driving this whole thing. Uh, we're also looking at something called an Arduino, which I actually seem, people seem to, a lot of people seem to play with, partly because if you go to Radio Shack, they're just sitting there for 30 bucks, you can get a computer that can connect to all sorts of devices and sensors and connectors. And really, anybody can do this. You know, hobbyists can do it, et cetera. So we're trying to explore, again, that notion of connection into the physical space. Um, and I'll just show you a couple of examples, um, just really quickly. Um, so this is uh, kind of from the, from the beginning prototyping part of the studio. This is using, I guess, a, a leap sensor connected to this little computer, connected to um, essentially a small motor. And you know, this is something that, uh, of course, you know, if you walk into any grocery store, 
this kind of thing is happening. You walk up, there's a sensor, the door opens, etc. What's interesting is that this is accessible to, you know, to MARC students, right? You don't have to be, you know, a, a building controls master's, you know, master's graduate in order to build something that has that kind of uh, connection from digital to physical uh, space. Um, if you carry this a little bit further, I'm just going to list, uh, show Robert and uh, Sinan's uh, work. And this is really now trying to tie that to uh, the behavior of a movable, of a movable architectural form. Um, and just to say that uh, they're exploring sort of the material physics. This is the stuff that you know, I spent years on and then I can just download. Um, that material behavior, sort of a connecting skeleton, how robots would then manipulate that, how uh, you could have a physical human device that's controlling that. Um, and then a little bit further in this, uh, you know, these are various tests about how you would, you know, sort of the idea of a human manipulable, reconfigurable, responsive space. Um, and uh, of course, this is kind of the hallmark of the idea studio. Uh, robots for everything, so the robot's going to essentially manipulate this thing. Um, and then let me get kind of to the end of this one, which is uh, yeah, let's just keep going forward, which is sort of the optical side of this. So uh, one of the students is looking at, you know, could you actually just look at this thing, and based on that, it can recognize uh, where you're looking, identify the tags, start mapping again back into a digital view, again go from digital, physical, personal, um, all those kind of connections. Uh, so it's a, it's a tremendously interesting uh, you know, area that, that we're working in, that we're working in with the ideas people. We're certainly not alone, but again, it's, I think it's both, it's interesting that it's accessible, it's even relevant to architecture, if you agree, um, and that um, it sort of talks about this, you know, there are students that are really sort of wrestling with this idea about what is a hybrid digital, physical world. Um, and so that, I think, will lead me to the last bit, which is the point where the whole thing always breaks down. So um, I, I have taught, at times, a 14-week semester on contemporary mathematics and why it matters, um, from, not just from a purely technical level, but from a phenomenological level. And I would argue that, um, to tee this up, um, architecture, even though we are working with modern mathematics, uh, heavily and cleverly obscured by you know, phenomenal software like Rhino that makes it easy, uh, we're still looking at the world from you know, an, an enlightenment, essentially a five or six hundred year old view of the mathematics of space. Um, and I want to try to break that down in the next ten minutes, uh, instead of fourteen hours uh, that have uh, tortured many a student at MIT. Um, but talk a little bit about the reconfiguration of space. And some of this is going to be a little bit um, bizarre, and you may not get it. But again, I'm going to borrow, uh, start from an image, which is the New World Symphony, uh, again, um, a Gary project. And he has been starting to work with this idea of projection on buildings. So I think one of the hallmarks of the, um, of the, the, the New World Symphony is the idea of projection, both internal and external. So here is just a view, as far as I can take it, of uh, a concert, and there's, uh, you know, there's, there's, um, there's, a, there's a, a projection of this symphony uh, on the exterior wall. We're actually doing remote projection on the inside walls as well. I'm sorry to have a picture of that. Um, but uh, so, so this is a projection on a surface in an architectural space. Might not seem that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, so that's maybe not that unusual, but. That's sort of the mind flip I'd like to propose is that, so here's a surface in an architectural space, and this is also an architectural space, and that's a surface. So if you look at um, this rectangle here, at one level, you can think about kind of six layers of space. Um, the space we're in, the space of the, paper, the, the, space of the screen, uh, the projection into some past view in Miami, the projection into that, into perhaps a, 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 um, a symphony that's playing on the other side of the world. And there's really kind of six layers of space that's compressed into this image that you're looking at. So you might say, well, that's just a projection. It happens all the time. But I think there's something really interesting about not the fact that you can buy a $1,000 projector and hook it up in a space, 
but that layering possibility of connected space and what it does as an image and a spatial proposition. Um, what's interesting about this, this problem is there's more surfaces. Um, there's uh, the surface of the camera that somebody took this photo with is converted to a space of a, a completely different space of digital bits, ones and zeros, is converted back to another sort of index view of, uh, of, um, of pixels and then projected back out here. Uh, and then that whole business is projected from the screen, transformed and projected into your view. So there's a whole bunch of these transformations that are happening. They're all connected and they're all spatial. And you know, maybe I'm losing people here, but I will just continue on. So that's an interesting proposition. What does that mean to, and I take sort of a, an ontological or phenomenological view of this, which is you can say, well, that's just media. The real world is here. What's the big difference? But from an architectural experience level, I would argue this is you know, as real as it gets. Um, and it's fundamentally changing the structure of, uh, of architectural space. And there's a whole lot more kind of ways that this sort of connected, transposed, and transformed a collection and network of spaces is starting to creep into architecture and uh, human experience. This is a very different view from the quote, uh, it's the, uh, you know, probably more properly the Cartesian view of the world, but we have, we come from a world that I think other, you know, is more sort of, we've learned it better, it's, uh, and, and I think we see this as the real world, which is, Essentially, I characterize this as you know, it's the three the classic three-dimensional world view. Somewhere out there, you know, we're sitting in a big vat of three-dimensional points, right? And objects are placed into those that three-dimensional vat of points, and they occupy a certain set of them. This is kind of the classical view of Cartesian three-space geometry. And when you're manipulating shapes in Rhino, you see the little X, Y, Z thing down at the bottom, and you're like sort of working in some sort of static three-dimensional space. There's a very sort of interesting set of kind of architectural qualities that I think are very much against what we believe in as architects. So if you play that out, there's this notion that space is essentially invariant. It's again, it's an infinite set, kind of a vat of unchanging three-dimensional points that different objects are placed into. Um, that space never changes. It's not affected by objects. Those objects are just placed in there. So form, is essentially just an occupancy of space, right? There's this form, which occupies these points, there's me, I occupy these over here. It's a very static view of objects and their relationships to space. Um, and objects are, ex are acted on by external forces, namely designers. So designers manipulate objects. They do not actually modify space. They just kind of cut it up by putting objects in it. And form is inert in the sense that it doesn't actually feed back and change, make any change to uh, the observer or the space it's contained. Suffice to say that, and I won't get too much into the contemporary um, world of, of um, you know, 20, 20th uh, and, and really 18th 20th to 20th century geometry, but that's not the view of physics anymore. And, um, and it's not the view of mathematics. It's not even the world view of mechanical engineering. Um, so I'd like to just kind of walk through kind of a change in what that evolution of space looks like and why it's important to, to us as architects. I'm going to skip this except to say that uh, there is a fundamental mechanism in contemporary mathematics um, which is called the transformation or the mapping. And it's exactly that idea of taking a three-dimensional object and projecting it so that it occupies perhaps the surface of this wall or a collection of bits or um, you know, or some other real or physical, real digital numerical physical space. This is really fundamental to all kinds of mathematics. And again, the idea is not that we are talking about static things in some sort of homogeneous space, but a collection of, con of connected spaces that can map to one another. Um, we've been doing this for a long time, so these are the kind of the classic uh, map projections. You can actually move back and forth from uh, a two-dimensional drawing to extrude it into three space, or a three-dimensional object and project it down and flatten it into two space. What's different now is, again, that these transformations and projections are continuous, they're continuously on, and they're connected. So it's not like an architect you know, or, a, or a, an artist you know, looks into three space and does this sort of numerical transposition and makes a painting and then parts it away. These things are continuously connected. 
and then you're connected not just in physical space, but in representational space, in digital, etc. Bear with me, uh, we're not going to get too much into the math, but suffice to say that the surface modelers like Rhino have this notion built into them. Um, and when you are manipulating a surface in Rhino, you're actually manipulating a space. It's a two-dimensional space. It's not your grandfather's space. It's a curved space. And it is actually exactly the mathematics of Einsteinian uh, space uh, time relativity. It is exactly those uh, mathematical manipulations and transformations that you're doing when you take a Rhino's uh, when you take a Rhino surface, map it from its UV space into its 3D space, and start doing transformations on it. Um, there's some really interesting, to me, examples of how these spaces combine. I get this, I don't know if you'll get it, but if you look at, for example, just to go back to the beginning of this lecture and where it all started, this is a surface of the Disney Concert Hall. It is actually a collection of a number of different spatial configurations. You can see sort of at one level, we're taking that surface and looking at the ruling lines um, that connect from a set of UV coordinates and express that as a set of ruling lines that describe that surface. We're also taking that surface, flattening it, drawing a pattern on it, and mapping it back into physical space. So you can see that really what this looks like is just, you know, at one level, a bunch of connections and bolts and extrusions is really the connection between two kind of surface views mapped into space and then projected in and out as sort of a set of interrelated fields. So, responding to hope because <laughs> they're like going, what are you talking about? Um, so, um, so that's a set of possibilities, right? That we can really look at these kind of spatial constructions and not just, you know, blobs of stuff in, in, in you know, what we consider the world space, but really there are various transpositions, look at things as a two-dimensional world, look at other two-dimensional possibilities and map across them also back into digital uh, space itself. <coughs> Um, for those of you that are familiar with parametrics, there's also a parametric space uh, behind all of these, um, behind all of these um, mathematical tools. It, you can think of it as the space of possibility or the space <coughs> of opportunity of a particular construction. All of these objects, these different configurations, are essentially different points in this set of parameters that are then expressed into, uh, into a spatial configuration. So these are different kind of uh, positions in this space of possible you know, ruled surface curtain walls. And that space itself is super high dimensional, um, and it has a structure itself. And you, as you kind of move from one sort of surface to another, you are really exploring that case of space of possibility, and that space has a structure, and the structure, structure is spatial. Um, let me just keep going. I think. Let's get to the end of this. So I guess I would close at that level. Um, well, let me, yeah, let's just leave it there. Uh, so that's really, I think, uh, I don't know, that's the whirlwind tour. Um, I think it kind of describes a set of, a set of topics that is of interest to architectural practice, to architectural theory. It's certainly interesting to, to us. Um, and it's certainly, I think, kind of, uh, a, a theme of architectural computation uh, that may not be visible to people when they're just sort of pulling up a tool and doing some drawing. There's some really fascinating things that are going on in terms of reconfiguring the industry, reconfiguring what we do, reconfiguring the possibility of where we as architects occupy in this constellation of activities. And um, I think some really interesting uh, sort of, again, uh, propositions about uh, the structure and the organization of the architectural form in the world uh, as we move from these kind of more you put in uh, discrete drawing symbolic things into this space of algorithms and uh, and the connected processes that uh, really start to form these um, these uh, these sets of possibility that are uh, really what we are starting to do as architects. I hope that made some sense if you are, uh, and I guess I would, yeah, so let's just leave it there. Um, we're obviously kind of looking at a very dynamic view of the world where you can create these connections as designers. Uh, it's not a static view of the world uh, where you're just kind of carving up the world. Um, it's a very different set of possibilities. If you are interested in any of this, uh, here's a couple of papers that I've written mostly on architectural design. I'll leave this up. 
Um, I hope that was worth your time. If uh, maybe you can talk a little bit more about it, Greg. Thank you very much. Trigger a whole other lecture because Zuna was very, very appropriate. I think we're very good by the way. But in that network, you talked a lot about impact of what architects are thinking about and delivering. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if quickly you could reflect on the reception and the capacity of the rest of the team from, I mean, structural engineering firms. Mm -hmm. Particularly early adopters of certain kinds of things. Just curious about how this trickles down even to the job site and to manufacturers. And if you just have some thoughts about where the action is and where you see this having the biggest impact. Uh, I guess I'll answer that elliptically. So of course, you know, the, the theoretical stuff is not it's just germane to that topic. But I guess I would say that. Um, I mean, first of all, I think it's all relevant. It's connecting all disciplines. Um, where it has stuck most in the evolution, where are we today? I think the, you know, the future is unevenly distributed. Um, there are superb fabricators that are doing robotic, uh, robotically controlled uh, curtain wall panels built directly off of architects' models. There are people who still uh, you know, bend metal um, by hand. And all of those possibilities are, are okay, right? I think there's a question about where all this registration happens and who is in control of what set of possibilities. And I guess the, the um, sort of the mission, I think, of, of GT and really I think uh, one of Frank's sets of interest in the industry is to, is who is going to take the authority of that set of possibilities? And when I look at the industry, I see you know, a lot of churn and a lot of uh, a lot of threat of um, you know uh, contractors who will say, you know what, just do the just do the you know, just do the, the schematic, just do schematic design. We'll take it from there, right? Um, and there's an economic shifting and uh, a power balance that happens when different people kind of take the center of this proposition. Uh, I don't think I'm answering your question, but you know I think all of these possibilities are open, and architects ha have the there's an opening for architects to, to have a whole new set of control and a whole new econ economic propositions about what they do as professionals. Uh, and then there are that possibilities for others in the in the in the supply chain as well. Um, so it is a very dynamic time in terms of what the the role of the architect is. Different architects are taking different pieces of that stance, and, um, and others are too. So it's a, it's a dynamic, dynamic time, it's a competitive and threatening time, and it's a, it's a time of, I think, tremendous change and tremendous opportunity as well. The other question I had is in terms of the, the role, the Lower Manhattan Construction Command Center. Command Center. I mean, that's a deep logistical part. And what I know about what you do is really taking the logistical questions earlier and earlier and earlier into the design process. I mean, is that something that you think is particular to area technologies, or do you think that's a trend that's got a kind of larger? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, you know, I, I hope we're leading to a certain extent, but you know, this is this is a trend. Um, it is. It, it comes in multiple forms. I was just in. Um, Singapore, and they were talking about early contractor involvement or something like that. It was ECI or something like that. But the notion that um, you get constructability and fabrication intelligence 
early enough in the design to, to actually guide the designer to decisions that are eminently buildable, that build on budget, uh, you know, that you, you don't need people reverse engineering or you know, value engineering your work when pricing happens. Um, that is a, a shift that I think is happening you know, in lots of places. And I think, uh, yeah, um, it's, uh, it's not, I would say, unique to us, but it's something we feel very strongly about. I think Frank, personally, is very interested in this, the connection between three important players, the designers, the makers, and the owners. And uh, I think as GT, sort of as the, the, the vehicle of that mission, I think there's tremendous opportunity to kind of forge that connection continuously through the process and to kind of cut out a lot of the middle, the, you know, the paperwork that kind of sits in the middle of this. Uh, I think that's a very much a hallmark of Frank's process. It's very much a hallmark of what we do, but I don't think we're unique in, uh, in, uh, in that idea of moving construction and economics and those sort of pragmatic decisions into the possible realm of the control and interest of the architect. Okay, then one last question, we'll open it up. How interested are you in verticality in the sense that the 90s and 2000s were all about both, let's say, places like Arab, mm -hmm. becoming more and more full services, one-stop consultants, so it wasn't structures at MEE anymore, it's just Arab, mm -hmm. to the point where even Arab principals started to declare they were better architects than their architects. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I mean, even earlier than that, you had places like you know, Skidmore, any number of places, bringing in their own structural engineers and mechanical and civil and the kind of AECOM world. So, I mean, there is a certain kind of model of vertical consolidation mm -hmm. going on. Do you see any of the things you're talking about having any influence one way or the other? Is it biased towards it? Is it biased to insert? Yeah. I mean, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I think that's a fundamental economic question of contemporary, you know, contemporary culture, right? I mean, um, and, you know, I think five years ago, I was really nervous because there was this sort of continual roll-up going on. AECOM was doing it, Stantec was doing it. There were these, it looked like, you know, you know, at the end of it, there would just be, you know, ultimately three or four companies. Um, and people around Gary Parker's is all, have often talked about the movie-making model, uh, which is a set of super talented people coming together for one project. Uh, it's a very dynamic idea of the kind of the economics of putting a project together. I don't feel like that role of thing is happening quite as much now, but I would definitely say that there is um, always a kind of a dynamic tension between uh, a bunch of really interesting economic forces like commodity, I mean, you know, look at kind of offshoring, which I think was, it looked like inevitably that, you know, the whole thing was going to be commoditized and there'd be engineers in, you know, in, you know, in, which I say third world countries, you know, doing what we could do, but for three dollars an hour. And I don't think that the, the story is really resolved one way or the other, and I don't think it, it will. I think there will always be this tension between sort of, uh, but you know, the other example that I would raise is, you know, just to pick uh, an architect that, you know, that I'm a fan of is, for no good reason, Zaha Hadid, right? Um, or even, you know, maybe somebody you know, like, like Greg Lidform, right? Uh, how, you know, before the facts, before the internet, the idea that you know a local small architect of talent in London could have this kind of explosive capacity to perform work on the on the world stage is uh, you know is is you know is a factor of or consequence of technology and information technology and communication. So I think you see these tensions between sort of commoditization and and you know and specialization or brand identity. Um, you know, and the consolidated view versus the specialist view. And it's a very dynamic kind of system from an economic and practice level. I, I think it will uh, will continue to be dynamic. I hope it will. Okay, so I'd like to open it up to anybody that has questions. Do you need the mic or? They may be, they may be the so, Should we have a... Uh, 
see it that way for a couple of reasons. First of all, you know, architecture is about choice and you know, selecting tools and manipulating them, uh, buying them, or deploying them, uh, you know, how you mix those into the decisions you make on a design level and on a practice level. I think these are, these are decisions that architects make. Uh, I don't think that um, the digital world, as I think I've been trying to say, I don't think the digital world any longer represents a threat or a, a, you know, a, a reduction of priority of the physical world. Um, and in fact, I think you know, this sort of, the fluidness of moving from digital to physical back is something that is becoming very, you know, not, not just um, familiar to young architects, I think they do it naturally, um, but also you know, to you know, the world at large. Everybody's got at least new computers on them, and you probably don't even want to think about them as structuring your experience, but you know, they are. You know, you may like some of it, but you have choice, and, and people on the other side of the fence are working really hard, really hard to make those technologies familiar to you and accessible. And when they get it wrong, you buy something else. So, um, so I, I, I don't know if that really answers, but I, I really don't think that, um, you know, I don't really, you know, I, I think if anything, technology is becoming more familiar. It certainly is empowering at a certain level. It, it can be threatening to some people, but it's becoming I think far less threatening. So, you know, ten years ago, I think you know half of the older folks in the room, you know, didn't like the whole computer business. They probably had some people sitting outside. But they, and now they go about them just carrying them in their pockets. And, you know, so I think it's I, maybe that makes sense. But I mean, one of the things Dennis didn't do was I don't think I ever heard you use the word tool. Mm -hmm. I think right. the message I got today is that technology is not a question of tools. Technology is a question of paradigm, which we use a lot, of milieu, of culture, of you know, the environment we live in. I mean, those were the kind of terms Dennis referred to technology as. And I think 10 years ago, we might have said, what tools are you using? But I think now Dennis is saying, what culture are you living in? And that architects need to move into a certain kind of technical culture. Yeah, absolutely. It's not just about what tools you're picking anymore. And that's a really big challenge. I mean, I think everybody's still reeling from, well, okay, I just threw away my May lines and I'm using CAD, but now you're telling me I have to think of culture but in a new way, yeah. but I mean, I think you kind of do. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, again, I mean, this is my problem, but you know, this stuff is everywhere, right? I mean, there's like 600 of these in this space, right? And they're actually, they're probably, some of you are texting each other, you know, I mean, this is part of the, the human spatial experience now, right? And uh, I think architecture really hasn't made that leap that about information spaces, these things that were part of, right? Forget about the process, the product is becoming information rich. Um, I think maybe a lot of the, the dialogue is hooked up on tools and process, um, but there's a much bigger play, which is what is the spatial experience and how this technology and physical stuff start. Uh, you began the lecture with an uh, example of how uh, subtle differences in algorithms can produce subtle differences in uh, shape in the form of architecture. And I'm wondering at a much less subtle level what the implications of what you've been discussing uh, are in terms of what you're in the architecture space. Uh, wait, I'll tell you what 
Okay, from a from a computational perspective, that's a really interesting question in itself. Um, you know, lots of BIM is being used to uh, to produce rectilinear and sort of classic geometries. Um, it, it has opened up a whole new, like multiple new languages of form, which is I think we're really just starting to come to terms with. The tools I think have run ahead of our capacity to understand the, the artifacts spatially. Um, but it turns out, I guess, in a, in a narrow, I think you're sort of asking, you know, does this apply to even more kind of, I don't know what to say, conventional, less designerly, uh, I don't know if the term right, but you know, sort of from a practical perspective, you know, how does it apply to us? I think it, it clearly is uh, applying in practice. And, um, and I think the, the, the sensibility and the construction is part of that Euclidean world. And the, the curve world is really just sort of an expansion of that sort of possibilities. Okay. Yes, I was asking a question in two dimensions. One is in terms of the technological, or technological dimension, in terms of what the connection might be in terms of the technology and the culture of the human more broadly to the kind of forms that the other is not so much technological, it's sociological. Mm -hmm. In terms of, uh, it seems to me that there's a particular group of architects or a particular group of interests that are going to be drawn to these kinds of technology and social mm -hmm. possibilities. Uh, and that also comes to, uh, I think, have an implication in terms of how architecture evolves and how it shapes. Yeah, you know, it's, it's hard for me because, you know, from a theoretical perspective, the non-Euclidean is just the Euclidean, but a, a broader thing, right? I mean, the Euclidean is the non-Euclidean, it's just kind of a special version of it. Um, there's certainly um, nothing more powerful than uh, an, an or what we call an ortho orthonormal, orthonormal field, right? We are in one here. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's funny, like, you know, I used to think at MIT, well, I'm not seeing any wood, but, you know, if that, if, there's a, if that was a wood panel, you know, why is that chair registered with Sepulveda Avenue? I mean, why, you know, how does this thing sort of, these rectilinear uh, systems, why do they propagate and why they're so powerful and strong? It's, a, it's an interesting question. So there's certainly power to that particular uh, set of, of spatial constructions. I guess I, I don't feel that just because it's more familiar to us that that makes it, you know, because just because there's a larger history of living in rectilinear, rectilinear things, that it's a more sort of human or natural world. Um, it just happens to be an incredibly powerful, uh, you know, spatial information construct. It's, you know, you can draw four lines on a, on a drawing. Uh, I used to give this example, I'd hand it to an engineer and say, how do you build this, right? And I'll say, oh, I'll use some CMUs here, and you know, a lintel here, right? And you can have a conversation between an architect and an engineer on four lines, right? I think there's something incredibly powerful about that geometry. Um, but I guess I don't feel like you know, there's some sort of anything heretical or sort of natural about these new geometries. But, I mean, this kind of interest in technology was associated with Expressionism. I yeah. think your talk was not really so much about form, it was much more about systems and you know, project, um, let's say interaction and collaboration. And I think all of that stuff is equally interesting to Peter Zumthor or whoever. What's very funny is a Peter Zumthor who squares off computers in favor of pencils and watercolor then gets involved in computers and all of a sudden they're doing goofy buildings in LA. That's maybe a more interesting question is when you enter into this stuff for other reasons than formal expression, why is it that all the people who 10 years ago objected to the computer are now doing weirdly expressive shapes? And I mean, that cuts across, you know, Williams and Tien and all, all kinds of people that were real anti-computer for the because they were anti-formal expression, we're now kind of like, you know, hey, let's make a weekly build. This feels very, it feels to me very, it puts me off weekly build, yeah. frankly. Yeah, I, I, I would agree, and you know, whatever, you know, I, 
guess a number of things. One is, you know, people talk about blob architecture, right? If I look at Frank's buildings, I don't see blobs. I see dynamicism and, and an incredible sort of tension and structure. It's just a different one, right? Um, and uh, at the same time, I think if you look broadly at this sort of new formal language, it's been very opportunistic. The reason it exists is because a set of tools, a set of tools became available, and people were driven by that set of possibilities. And now there are more and more sort of algorithmic opportunities. I think that you know my peeves it does feel in some ways like the, the sort of the possible tools are driving the form. And I don't think that architecture has really yet come up to the point where they even sort of, this is sort of the spatial side. Do you really understand what that spatial leap is to this new sort of possibility? Or are we just kind of being opportunistic? Yeah, um, let me see what I can question. Six years ago, I graduated from this school. Right? And Greg just moved from New York. And I was taking you at the course of the bus, you the silver. And the computer technology just came to the computer technology. I was taking <clears throat> so you with me. The computer technology was so advanced that the way how you were designing, the building technology was going behind. And all these shapes which when there is promoting, uh, we couldn't kind of implement right away because when the building process just was not to that kind of stage, but you know, the way how you were designing. The second thing is, I had a second master instruction from a European mm -hmm. engineer. The way I looked at the building, for instance, Santiago Paul Trout has to push the building to the area to lose everything with grid cages, right? It doesn't shape the beam or the column you know, with the same size, but the way how end diagram or the diagram end diagram works, where the DVC you know, forces, actually the section is going to be bigger, then, you know, the force is much smaller. And it doesn't make sense, you know, to put so much section there when the force is so, so, so small. And that's why they look so dynamic. Well, forget about this. All these shapes which you're showing, you know, I do it in computer technology. I'm a monster. Mm -hmm. Probably I'm better than you're you, you rich at that. Mm -hmm. Search engineering, probably I'm also so good, you know, to put the technology which you're putting on the computer, but also the construction put a good deal to allow it the proper, you know, the shape in such a way that you put this together. Mm -hmm. Well, your previous question was exactly the we designed the building. We have, but the process later, when it goes to the building process, and you take a computer program, you take it on the product, and it gives you a sandwich line, and the guys have to execute it. But this is where, you know, practicing this profession for 16 years kind of shocks, you know, working in China, working here in several offices. How Frank here is able, you know, to build this shape in the manufacturing line, whatever it is. Does he give, you know, the program to somebody? Does he give the product to somebody in the sandwich line? How actually this happens from manufacturing? Right. How these shapes are curved? Mm -hmm. Who curves them? Are they then manually? Are they put in the sandwich line and somebody, some machinery, sir? You know, how the glass becomes curved? You know, this is kind of shocking thing where people say, well, okay, we're going to design this, but how are we going to manufacture it? And this is where people kind of say, oops, wait a moment. What are you going to do? How are you going to do it? If you can put it. Please. Okay. All right. So that's a lot of stuff. Um, and I guess, first of all, just let me just. I don't think that Frank is promoting any sort of. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Um, but you'll have. A lot of this stuff, at the, at the formal language level, you have to ask him. And I don't claim to be. Uh, actually, I claim to really not understand what. After 20 years, I'm still not quite sure. Uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm an, an, an outside so I that, so. But I will tell you that from the process perspective, uh, under no circumstances can you look at, at Frank's practice as a, an organization that does a shape and then says, somebody go figure out how to realize that. Everything about that practice is, is, is a deep connection to the set of possibilities of what specific and general fabricators can do. I think if you look at the history of his work, it's always been about taking some very simple system, you know, sheet, uh, you know chain link fence or um, corrugated metal. And I hate to sort of like, you know, 
put words in his mouth, but you know, what is the sort of possibility of that system? Um, what can it really do? Um, and really kind of pushing the limits of any specific system. As a consequence, you know, there are buildings which have a stunning metrics. The, the Beekman Tower is one that always comes up in New York. It has a, a curved facade. Um, it was worked through to exacting detail with permits to do these. They gave a kind of a, a, a very rich, a rich set of rules that said, you know, if the stack joint is four inches or less, we can build it. You know, if the um, if the you know if the if the curvature of the surface is within some sort of constraints, we can build it for essentially the price of a conventional curved wall. As a consequence, the the developer, uh, Forest City Ratner, built two uh, residential towers at the same time in New York and got the same curved wall price for both of them. One is a completely conventional curved wall. One is the Beekman Tower, which offers bay windows and you know unique experiences at each level, balconies and all this kind of stuff. And that's done by virtually going through, virtually constructing, if you want to think of it, that design to fabrication to you know assembly process, not just once but 50 times, with the pricing and the fabrication rules and constructability notions all the way back into the studio as they were doing these this shaping. So when it comes out, there's no surprises. It's completely buildable. It's handed to the fabricator almost as a, a digital shop drawing. Like we, we almost did the complete set of shop drawings that then they would take forward into the construction process. It meets a budget. There are no surprises to been rationalized to that budget. Um, and I guess I'm going on and on, but I, I do, like, if there's any sort of perception that this is just a formal proposition and not a, an economic and supply chain and manufacturing and engineering proposition, I really want to dispel that. I think Calatrava's got his own set of intentions, his own kind of formal language. I don't think that any of this is really a surprise to what he's doing. I don't think he just draws something and has somebody else build it, even if the engineering is kind of more form versus functionalist or you know whatever it is. Um, but I don't, you know, I, I hope I'm kind of answering your question. I mean, this is not a geometry exploration <coughs> that's divorced from supply chain and economic and, a, and a execution and constructability. What I'm interested in is, you to me this out. This is the problem, this is the product. You, the manufacturer, it has that kind of shape. The section changes from this to yeah. that. Yeah. How you want to do it? Well, there's, I mean, I don't know, once it's looking in the literature, there's, there's tons of building systems that come to mind as there are, you know, there are standard curtain wall extrusions that are used that are manually bent in shape. One thing that I just want to maybe want to, an interesting, there's an interesting comparison between, uh, you mentioned Calatrava and the, the tapered beam. Maybe this is a good place to go. Uh, that has, let's call it an engineering optimization view, right? Um, but it's actually probably pretty expensive to build. Right, I mean, that's a hard shape to build. Maybe he's got it worked out. Right, uh, Gary's architecture, you know, is maybe not this this uh, kind of structural optimization, but it is an economic optimization and it is a building systems optimization. Sometimes building the simplest thing, um, the simplest uh, using a simple system in a complex way, is actually more efficient than using than than, than optimizing material. But, I guess I'd like to kind of maybe focus on that, which is there is a sort of a, a formal engineering and economic proposition that you're raising, and it's not clear which one is the more optimal or the more the kind of the more fit to the problem. It's very complex. I'm getting the point. I mean, one of the, the the one that blew me away is on the 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 one for Marshall Roads in New York. Oh, I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah. You know, I was saying, wow, that is a lot of curved glass. And I think it was you that told me, well, we found out you could bend glass to 8% of its panel size at that dimension. So all they're doing is just bolting the one corner of the glass in even further to get it to curve. Yeah. As conventional curve. Yeah. So that kind of an approach is more what Dennis advocates for than, than let's say, some uh, you know, bespoke I mean, and that's probably what's, you know, you guys lived in China? Hong Kong. You know, Cristiano, 
in the music business talks a lot about, you know, the, you know, the, the work where they try to get curved panels in, yeah. in China. And it varies from, you know, explosive forming or, you know, three CNC driven, uh, you know, 3D former to a guy with a mallet, um, you know, banging on, <laughs> banging on his piece of metal. And I think that's the the, ec the interesting kind of economic. I, I don't know. Sorry, to cut you off. No, no, because you guys have a huge. Yeah. You know, right. I, I kind of heard this kind right. of strategy, yeah. and I think it's brilliant to embrace a lot of that yeah. aspect. Yeah. But it's all in place. Right. It's all it's all good. You know, it's, this approach works with you know a guy spray painting you know uh, points on a on a on a, a concrete slab and putting up you know plywood plywood um, plywood formwork. You know, it works when robots are involved. But we're not at the end of this story, right? There's still a lot of, um, you know, there's still a lot of really rich sort of craftsmanship in making these things. It's just a question of like where the information kind of flows in this ecosystem of building, and you know how it sort of transmutes to, you know, actually be, you know, sometimes the most economical approach is, you know, a guy spraying dots on a, on a or, or you know, uh, people doing carpentry, right? Sometimes it's for bottoms. Okay. Well, I feel like we've already taken advantage of it. Yeah, and by the way, this is part of my little contribution to the lecture series where all the lecturers are contractually obligated to come back to Rumble. <laughs> <laughs> so really the idea is I tried to pick people that would provoke the students to respond to your lecture in their work this quarter and next, so that when you come back from Rumble, hopefully you'll see some of this on the walls. Okay, well, or in the cloud. Or have you come back, and if you're in our studio in Ideas, I don't know if this, I hope this makes some sense. <laughs> it maybe helps figure out where we're trying to take this, or just one, one view of it. But, you know, I think it's really exciting what we're doing with Ideas. Great work to push in play this. Place uh, setting. Thanks, guys.